So this will be a talk on calcium regulation. So calcium regulation is tightly regulated and it's regulated by parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Parathyroid hormone being a hormone released from the parathyroid, as the name would imply. Calcitonin being a hormone that's released from the, uh, from the C cells of the, uh, of the parafollicular thyroid cells. So the uh, primary organs that these uh, two mediators target uh, in collection are the parathyroids, the bones, the small bowel, and the kidney. The normal serum calcium level is 9 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter, so very tightly regulated. There's only about 1.5 points of, of normal fluctuation. Now, you may see falsely normal values or even falsely abnormal values in patients who have renal or liver disease. And that's because calcium is normally attached to albumin and the calcium that's actu that actually works, that's, that's active, is ionized calcium. In other words, calcium that's not attached to albumin. So if your serum albumin is low, then your serum calcium level is going to read falsely low. And so that could make you think that perhaps a patient has hypocalcemia that actually is uh, normal calcemic, or a patient is normal calcemic who is in reality hypercalcemic. So let's say, for instance, you have a patient whose albumin level is, or whose calcium level is reported to you as 10.3 on the labs. Uh, and you know that the patient has hypoalbuminemia, you're going to use, if, if you know the patient has hypoalbuminemia, in other words, if the patient's albumin level is less than four, uh, you're going to use a formula uh, where you take the reported calcium level and you add to it 0 0.8 times the quantity four minus the patient's albumin level. And so let's say the patient has a, albumin, or a calcium level of 10.3 and they have an albumin level of three then you're going to take your calcium level of 10.3 and add it to 0 0.8 times 4 minus the albumin level, which is 3. That's 4 minus 3, which is 1. And so uh, and 0 0.8 times 1 is 0 0.8. So you actually have a corrected calcium of 10.3 plus 0 0.8 or 11.1. .1. And so rather than being 10.3, which is falls in this normal range, this patient is actually hypercalcemic. And the reason is because they don't have enough albumin to bind all the calcium that's in their blood. And so they have an elevated level of ionized calcium. So even though they've got the same amount of calcium as a, person, a normal person with 10.3, because they don't have enough albumin to bind that calcium, there's going to be more ionized calcium. And hence, they're going to act as if they have hypercalcemia. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're in any trouble, but it means they may have symptoms, and so you should know what your corrected calcium level is in any patient who has hypoalbuminemia. The calcium in the blood has a huge responsibility, and that is to stabilize neuronal membranes and discharges, and not just neuronal membranes uh, and discharges, but also the, the uh, discharge of the cardiomyocytes. So this is going to be really important as far as uh, that significant disturbances in serum calcium will always lead to neurologic symptoms. It can also lead to shortening or elongation of the QT interval. And that's because the calcium influx comes in uh, during uh, the, the, uh, the repolarization of the ventricles. And so whether or not if you have a high or a low level, uh, that may prolong or shorten that level. Uh, so um, most, as I mentioned, most mild disturbances of calcium are asymptomatic. Okay, so this is just a diagram that I made, uh, kind of, I probably should put these on opposite sides, but uh, you can see here what these hormones do. So parathyroid hormone is going to be triggered and nor normally to be released when the calcium level uh, starts to get below nine. And parathyroid hormone has a direct activity on the bone. It triggers the osteoclast to increase activity, which increases the amount of calcium released into the blood. It uh, promotes the uh, it promotes the release of of uh, of calcium and uh, of 
phosphate. So calcium coming back into the into the blood by reabsorption and phosphate leaving by uh, way of the urine. And then it also triggers the uh, uh, the conversion of 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125 hydroxy vitamin D, uh, also known as uh, calcitriol. And 125 dioxy vitamin D calcitriol is the most active form of vitamin D. So uh, what vitamin D does when it's active is it allows the small bowel to reabsorb or to absorb calcium and phosphate. So indirectly, by uh, allowing the transformation of 25 vitamin D to 125 vitamin D, you're uh, you're allowing the small bowel absorption of calcium and phosphate. So parathyroid hormone increases calcium by osteoclast activity, increases calcium and decreases phosphate by altering reabsorption in the kidney. It increases the conversion of uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125 hydroxy vitamin D, and that therefore increases the conversion or the absorption of calcium and phosphate via these vitamin D mediated uh, channels, and that's in the intestine. So the net effect is going to be to decrease phosphate and increase calcium. So patients who have abnormally high levels of phosphate or of, of parathyroid hormone rather they're going to have high calcium and low phosphate in their serum. Calcitonin, on the other hand, is released by the parafollicular C cells of the thyroid, uh, and that is in response normally to calcium that's greater than 10.5. And it has three activities. First, it's going to inhibit osteoclasts, so it works in the exact opposite way as parathyroid hormone. Second, it's going to reduce the absorption of calcium and phosphate in the small bowel. And third, it's going to reduce the absorption, of, reabsorption of calcium in the kidney. It also has an effect of increasing the urination of phosphate, and that's similar to parathyroid hormone. So the net effect of calcitonin is going to be to de decrease calcium in the serum and to decrease phosphate in the serum. However, that's not really clinically uh, important. So really what you should remember with calcitonin is that it tones down the calcium. It decreases calcium in the serum. So PTH increases calcium in the serum and decreases phosphate in the serum, and calcitonin decreases calcium in the serum. Okay, so parathyroid hormone. Normally it's released by, uh, in, by the parathyroids in response to low serum calcium. The overall effect is an increase in serum calcium and increase in serum phosphate. So we already talked about this. The effects are to increase activity of the osteoclast that demineralizes bone, releases calcium into the serum. It indirectly increases calcium by converting 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. That's going to increase small bowel absorption of calcium and phosphate. And I will note right now that another word for 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is calcitriol. Uh, Three, it increases calcium reabsorption in the kidneys directly, and four, it decreases phosphate reabsorption in the kidneys. So you got three places of activity, the bone, the gut, uh, kidney slash gut, and kidney. The net effect is an increase in serum calcium, decrease in serum phosphate. Calcitonin, on the other hand, is released by the parafollicular C cells. That's actually in the thyroid and that's uh, released in response to a high serum calcium. And calcitonin tones down the calcium, so that's a way you could remember it. The effects are going to be all direct. They uh, decrease the activity of osteoclasts, that reduces bone demineralization. It decreases small bowel absorption of calcium and phosphate. It decreases calcium reabsorption in the kidneys, but like parathyroid hormone, it decreases phosphate reabsorption in the kidneys, increases phosphate excretion. So the net effect is going to be decrease in serum calcium and a decrease in phosphate, but like I said, that decrease in serum phosphate does not happen to a clinically uh, relevant manner. You never, it's, it's very rare, I've never heard of any condition where you have extremely high levels of calcitonin 
in a primary uh, disease. Uh, it could happen in response, but it doesn't happen in a primary disease. So there's, there's really nothing that's going to cause, uh, as far as calcitonin goes, that's going to cause that phosphate to go abnormally low. Parathyroid hormone, on the other hand, uh, can be uh, secreted in large amounts in a primary manner from the, uh, from the parathyroids. Uh, that would be primary hypoparathyroidism. And uh, that would cause a significant decrease in the serum phosphate. So what are some of the causes of calcium disturbance? We'll look first at hypercalcemia. So this is any time we have a serum calcium greater than 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. Far and away, number one cause, you should know this from the test, is primary hyperparathyroidism. So uh, this is just the, hyper, the parathyroid secreting excess amounts of parathyroid hormone without respect to uh, the physiology. Malignancy is another thing you have to be concerned about whenever you have uh, hypercalcemia. You should always uh, make sure you get a good review of systems because uh, hypercalcemia can be uh, a, a presenting feature of, of malignancy. It would be pretty rare, but it can be. So uh, bone demineralization is typically the way that this happens. That's from metastases to the bone, causes, uh, causes destruction of the bone, the calcium gets absorbed into the circulation. Uh, with uh, squamous cell lung cancer, you can get a, uh, it can release a peptide called parathyroid hormone re uh, resembling peptide. Uh, and this acts similarly to parathyroid hormone. The result of that is going to be uh, simulated hyperparathyroidism. Familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia is a uh, hereditary condition. It's quite rare. Uh, however, what you would expect to see in this case is a patient with a high end of normal or elevated calcium uh, in their blood and a low calcium in their urine. Typically, these patients are asymptomatic and we don't need to treat them. So this is just good academic knowledge. Thiazide diuretics can cause uh, hypercalcemia by the diuretic effect. So look for that in the patient's chart. Uh, if you're uh, working with psych patient, bipolar patient, uh, look for lithium as uh, part of their treatment. That can also cause hypercalcemia. Hypocalcemia is a serum calcium less than 9. And the number one cause is hypoparathyroidism, typically after surgical removal of the thyroids. The, the parathyroids are lodged very intimately in the thyroid tissue. And so it can be very difficult to uh, avoid dissecting the parathyroids when you take the thyroid out. Some surgeons are pretty skilled and can uh, manage keeping them in, but it can, they can accidentally be taken out. So uh, if the thyroid is removed for one reason or another, uh, be vigilant for hypoparathyroidism. It works the other way around. If a patient comes in with uh, hypocalcemia, you should immediately think uh, hypoparathyroidism and look at their chart for thyroid removal. Hypovitaminosis D uh, causes uh, reduced absorption in the gut. And so uh, look for things such as malnutrition, uh, particularly fat, or fat absorption issues, so celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, and then insufficient UV exposure, uh, that is pretty uncommon. Uh, you don't need much UV exposure to make your vitamin D. Uh, malabsorption, I already talked about that. And then uh, loop diuretics and bisphosphonates uh, can uh, result in a hypocalcemia. So some symptoms of calcium disturbances. So for hypercalcemia, the mnemonic is stones, bones, moans, and psychiatric overtones. And this is really the best way to remember this. Uh, there's one other important symptom that I'm going to talk about last. Uh, but as far as the stones, that's nephrolithiasis, as I'm sure you know. Bones, you can get, uh, you get decreased bone mineralization uh, and osteoporosis. Because of that, you get bone pain. You can have abdominal pain for a reason I don't know, probably related to the fact that if you have hypercalcemia, it can aggravate pancreatitis. And then neuronal hypoactivity. So remember back to the fact where I said that calcium 
it uh, stabilizes the membranes of, of neurons. Well, what happens is that when you have a high level of calcium in your blood, the neurons become hypoactive. And the reason is, and if you don't remember this, that's fine. But the reason is because when the, the, the neurons are repolarizing, it's sodium that's rushing back uh, uh, into uh, the, the space. And so if you have calcium there, it can act as a competitive inhibitor. And so high calcium leads to neuronal hypoactivity. High calcium, hypoactivity. And that kind of neuronal hypoactivity is manifested as lethargy, confusion, and coma. And that's just the opposite of what happens in hypo, hyper, hypocalcemia, rather, hypocalcemia, where you get neuronal hyperactivity. All right, now, uh, another thing with hypercalcemia is that you can get nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And this is going to be important because when you're treating a patient who's acutely hypercalcemic, you definitely need to replace their volume. And so calcium can, uh, can interact with, uh, with antidiuretic hormone and it can inhibit it. So uh, high calcium can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now, for hypocalcemia, primarily you're just going to have neuronal, uh, neurologic symptoms. So the symptoms of neuronal hyperactivity are paresthesias, particularly perioral paresthesias around the mouth and around the lips, hyperactive reflexes, plus three plus four reflexes, muscle spasm, spasticity, tetanus, and seizures. There's two very characteristic signs of hypocalcemia that, frankly, you'll never see. I've never seen it, and nobody I've worked with has ever seen it, but the USMLE likes to throw it at you because they're, they're old uh, pathognomonic signs. So Trousseau's sign particularly is pathognomonic, and that's an involuntary contraction of the wrist with blood pressure cuff inflation. Chvostek's sign is a spasm of the facial muscles on percussion of the facial nerve. With hypocalcemia, you can also get QT prolongation, and that just has to do with the fact that, uh, that calcium is needed to uh, repolarize the ventricles. So QT prolongation and hypocalcemia. But what I'd really focus on remembering is uh, the neuronal hypoactivity with hypercalcemia and the neuronal hyperactivity with hypocalcemia. And this is just a review of that diagram that I gave you.